German battlecruisers. For this, arguably even more so than the British ones, it really is important to start by giving some background. The German Navy, such as it was, grew out of the Prussian Navy and those of assorted smaller German states. For much of the 19th century, it was a coastal defense force, and honestly a pretty small one at that. Germany was, then, as of now, as much as they have one now, a land power, and she really didn't need a navy. Germany's biggest enemy was France, with the side of Austria, and eventually Russia, after Austria became friendly, none of whom are exactly great naval powers. This would only really begin to change with the arrival of Kaiser Wilhelm II to the throne. Good old Kaiser Willy. You're going to see a lot of him in anything involving the German Navy. Trust me right there. To summarize some very complicated things that need way more focus than this video can give them, again, I would really recommend reading Dreadnought. That covers a lot of the stuff that I can't talk about here without making this... Well, honestly, a several hour long video. There's a lot of material here that needs to be covered and is covered much better in that book. But for the purposes of this video, Wilhelm was always fascinated by his British relations, trying to be as British as he could be and all of that fun stuff. There might have been a bit of an inferiority complex here too, considering just how terribly King Edward treated him. Regardless, one way that this shaped up would be in forging a far more powerful German navy. The Kaiserliche Marine, I probably butchered that, so back to German navy from here on, I just wanted to at least try, began to shift from a coastal force to a true blue water navy. The infamous High Seas Fleet. Part of this was Wilhelm, Part of it was to secure German colonies in the place in the sun that he craved. Still Wilhelm, if you want to go for that view. And part of it was Admiral Tirpitz, the man who had managed to worm his way into being in charge of the navy. Tirpitz wanted to build a navy on the concept of what he called risk theory. To use a more common term, a fleet in being. In absolute simplest terms, build a navy strong enough to force the Royal Navy to take such severe losses to put it down that they wouldn't bother. Hence, risk theory. Risk the Empire to take down the Germans, or accept the German Empire to maintain the British Empire. Good in concept would rather spectacularly backfire because... Instead of just thinking, oh, the German Navy's too strong, the British decided, okay, we'll just get good relations with everyone else, ally with Japan, so we can focus our fleet without worrying about the Empire. Tirpitz kind of made a mistake there, but it wasn't really obvious at the time, so I can't entirely blame him. Moving along, though. In many ways, the German Navy under Tirpitz would be something of a mirror and miniature of the Royal Navy. German construction plans were similar, if smaller. Battleships and big armored cruisers that followed the British design theory instead of, say, the French one. This was especially notable in the armored cruisers, which could almost stand beside the British ones in design concept. That would continue right up until Blücher, the last of the type. Of course, as mentioned in other videos, that unfortunate ship was obsolete before she even touched the water. When the true design of Invincible became known, less an armored cruiser, more like a battleship, the Germans would somewhat understandably panic a bit. Tirpitz, who had been trying to lower costs in light of the Dreadnought Revolution, had his hand forced here. It was well too late to change up Blücher, so the next armored cruiser would have to be a counter for Invincible. This would be the genesis of G.K. Grosser, Grosser Kreutzer. Again, probably butchering that, going to switch to G.K. from now on. The latter SMS Vonderton. Honestly, I'm probably going to butcher a lot of German in here, so I apologize for that. 
with the background established, we can move on to the battle cruisers themselves. Now, German concept, as it developed, was honestly quite unique in this regard. Most countries would follow the British to some extent or another. The Japanese Congos were full-on the logical extension of their contemporaries, the Splendid Cats, to the point that Tiger almost fits in with them. The American Lexingtons were, well, as that video went over, giant scouts, but they were still following the same general theme as the Royal Navy. It's harder to judge with smaller navies, as the closest any of them got was the Russians with Ismail, but I digress. The Germans 100% went their own way, constrained by budget and the size of the Kiel Canal and dockyards. They could not make as large of ships, nor as many. This would lead the German concept to go towards something like light battleships as much as anything else. I tend to like calling them proto-fast battleships in recognition of Wilhelm's continued fascination with, and arguments for, a merging of the cruiser and battleship into a fast battleship. This is not, by any means, disclaimer, a formal thing. I just like doing it myself because I like acknowledging what the Germans were actually aiming for. They are not actually prototype fast battleships. Okay? Okay. The Germans, for their part, stuck with the GK designation in formal documents, that meaning large cruiser, or in service, Panzerkreuzer. Again, apologies. That means, literally, armored cruisers. So they just continued calling them armored cruisers in actual service. They never did call their ships battle cruisers, but in general recognition of what they actually were for all intents and purposes, that is the typical thing for calling them. I, as mentioned, default to calling ships what navies call them. But in this case, as I don't want to keep butchering the ears of my German viewers, I will alternate between GK and Battlecruiser just for that. I will try to use GK more often, though. At any rate, you can see the German concept from von der Tann right up through their late last designs. Well, the last of the Kaiser's Navy, anyway. Von der Tann was slower and slightly shorter than Invincible, but displaced more tonnage due to the most crucial feature of Imperial German GK designs. Heavier armor protection. As a general rule, these ships would always have heavier armor than their British contemporary. For his part, Turpus was not fond of this, but the Kaiser and many of his subordinates were. It was the continued fascination with fast battleships, yes, but also a reflection of German means, where Turpitz desired a direct copy of Invincible, in concept, not in design. The Kaiser, and others, wanted a ship that could, after battle was joined, move into the main battle fleet and fight head-on against other capital ships. For this, the ships needed much heavier armor. I mentioned that the British would move to using their ships in a similar way, not identical, but similar, but the Germans designed them explicitly for this role right from the very first one. They didn't move towards it, they were always intended to fight in the battle line. Now, after von der Tann, the armor would increase until you hit the peak in Der Flinger, where she was only slightly less armored than a contemporary, German, battleship. The follow-on designs that were actually laid down, the Mackensen and Ersatz York, that meaning replacement York, that's what the Germans and Austrians did when they ordered a ship. They would call it Ersatz, insert ship name here, because it's a replacement for whatever ship the name of the ship is. The Ersatz Yorks never got a proper class name, so they are known to history as Replacement York. Unfortunate for them, but it's what it is. At any rate, those two ship designs had more or less the same armor scheme as Derflinger, with some minor improvements here and there. After that, you get into purely conceptual GK designs, but I will get into those at a later date, either in the second German battlecruiser video or in a video all their own. 
Later on, though, when the Germans looked at battle cruisers again in the Nazi period, you have the O class. As a development of the Panzerschiff, it would become basically renowned a couple decades late. Same amount of guns, same caliber of guns, basically the same armor protection. Funny how that worked out. That little detour aside, with von der Tann, the German naval department saw, with a good bit of foresight admittedly, that any large cruisers that Germany built wouldn't be able to fulfill the traditional cruiser role. Germany would have real issues either breaking past any blockade or, sur or supplying distant cruisers. And it is rather telling that only lighter such ships were used as merchant raiders. Protected cruisers, older armor cruisers that happened to not be in Germany at the time. Things like that. In this regard, the focus for the German GK ships, in direct contrast to Tirpitz's wishes, were as a fast wing of the battle fleet. The design project that led to von der Tann in this regard called for 6 to 8 28 centimeter, that is 11 inch, guns of the same kind mounted in the ship that would become Nassau, the first German dreadnought. In fact, upon completion, von der Tann would use the exact same turrets as that battleship. The other notable features of this design project, and the specifications thereof, armor that was approximately 10-20% to 20 less than Nassau, or Ersatz Bayern at this point in time, and a speed of around 23 knots. The final von der Tann was faster than that, arguably had better armor than that, but the guns were right. That's because initial concepts tend to develop several times over. Remember how many things the Lexington design went through. And I'll get into more detail on each of these successive designs in a video on von der Tann herself. Since this is just an overview of German battle cruisers, we will move on by saying that when she came out, von der Tann was a fast and powerful vessel. Lighter armed than invincible, though not by much, maybe not quite as fast, again, not by much, but with much better protection. Von der Tann's protection is roughly on par with the Lions, in fact even slightly thicker than them, and substantially better than Invincible or Indefatigable. In every way, she reflects the entire concept of what would become German battlecruisers. Her weapon layout, for example, would be followed more or less by the two follow-on designs, Moltke and Seidlitz. Or Seidlitz, I've heard it pronounced either way, but I tend to default to Seidlitz. It wouldn't be until Der Flinger that it changed, truly, other than adding an extra super-firing turret at the stern. I already went over the British reaction to von der Tann in their own videos, so with that in mind, I'll briefly cover the other pre-war German designs, again, much as I did with the British ones. So, von der Tann was a direct response to the Invincibles, and honestly a bit of a rush design. She came out to be a very nice and successful ship, certainly, but you can't ignore that she was a rush design. Improvements needed to be made in future designs. This would come in the second German battlecruiser, SMS Moltke. Unlike the second British battlecruiser design, the Germans did not just copy their first design with some improvements and some back trafficking in some areas, hello armor protection. Moltke was changed in some pretty fundamental ways from von der Tann. The most visible of these are arguably the cutout bow, there will be a picture of this on screen, that would become a standard feature all the way through Ersatz York to some varying degree or another. This was done to improve her turning ability in recognition of her slim rudder and stern layout. Which was probably a good thing that it did, as Moltke had a surprisingly good turning radius when she was moving at decent speed. When slow, she turned rather like a fat whale, but then again, bow cruisers and GKs are designed to be fast, so yeah. Anyway, the issue with this design of bow would become apparent during the war. It reduced buoyancy forward, unsurprisingly considering there was less bow to begin with. 
which would have catastrophic implications for Lutzow and almost for Sablitz at Jutland. Now, this is a pretty common thing with any design feature, no matter the nation or service branch. Everything is going to be a trade-off for something. In the case of the German GK's past Fondertan, they traded off some buoyancy forward for better turning circles. You can argue up and down if that was the right choice or not, but I digress. Moving past that, the other very visible change from von der Tann would be in the weapons, as previously mentioned, a different turret layout. Where the earlier ship had just four turrets, arranged somewhat like Invincible, the Moltke design would have five turrets. An additional turret had been added to the stern, superfiring over the other stern mount. This would give the ship a very theoretical 10-gun broadside because in practice, the same issues with cross-deck fire, damaging ship boats, damaging the deck, those such things, were as much of an issue here as they were with the British ships. So while you can theoretically fire over the deck, it wasn't done much in practice. Still, a theoretical 10-gun broadside still works out to an 8-gun broadside, which still works out to two more guns than Fonderton would be able to, in practice, use. As well as this fact, the guns themselves were, while admittedly still 11 inches, now 50 caliber instead of 45, equating to higher velocity. Remember the Lexington and South Dakota videos? The 16 inch 50 having better velocity than the 16 inch 45? Same thing here. 11 inch 50 has a better velocity than an 11 inch 45. This improvement in firepower is one of the key features of Moltke though she would admittedly still lag behind the British in that by this point they had moved to, and admittedly inefficient in light of her superstructure, all center line layout with Lion, as well as jumping up further above the Germans by getting 13.5 inch guns. In fact, before I move on to Sablitz, that lack in barrel size would continue straight through the German GK designs until you get into the conceptual poster Satz York ones. From von der Tann through Sablitz, the Germans stuck with 11-inch weapons. Der Flanger increased this to 12 inches, still smaller than the British, and even Mackensen used 35 centimeter or 13.8 inch guns. Ironically enough, in that regard, the British would move to 15-inch guns on the Admirals and heavier armor there, largely because of Mackensen, assuming she had such weapons herself. Ursatch York would have 15-inch guns, same as those on the Bayern-class battleships. But by that point, the G3 design, and God forbid the N3 design, were coming in and thoroughly outclassed her again. It isn't until you get into the conceptual designs that the Germans move to 16-inch guns. Now, mind you, this is a very conscious choice on the part of the Germans, as I brought off in the Salitz video. They were intended to fight at close range, where size of the shell mattered a bit less. And perhaps more importantly, cost concerns. The bane of every navy or military branch ever. Jumping up in gun size comes with a consequent increase in cost, especially since the ships also get bigger. And the German navy was always going to be second to the German army in terms of money. It is telling that it took the Great War to really loosen the purse strings to allow for an increase in size. With that little tangent out of the way, the final pre-war German battlecruiser was SMS Sadlitz. I won't go into much detail here because I already have a, and nearly not as lengthy as this one's turning out to be, but still lengthy, video on her for the channel. I would recommend watching that if you're more interested in the specifics of her service history and design. The main thing I will go over here is the continuing development of German doctrine and how it reflected in the ships. With a full acceptance by this point of the idea that GKs were meant to serve in the line as a fast wing, the armor protection of these ships had continued to increase. Von der Tann was heavily armored than Invincible, but her thickness was still relatively thin by battleship standards at just shy of 10 inches at the thickest with, as well, less coverage compared to a battleship to begin with. In Moltke, the thickness increased to 11 inches at the thickest, with an equal increase in th coverage. 
This process would, again as mentioned in her own video, continue with sablets. Her armor increased to chest shy of 12 inches at the thickest, which was very much battleship grade armor, it is still a tad on the light end in thickness and in coverage. British battle cruisers went on equal that until Hood, which surpassed it, mind you. But even that was with a post Jetland modification to the Admiral class design, as I mentioned in the British video. The other big change between the ships, including Vonderton, was a steady increase in speed with each new design. Moltke went about a knot faster than her predecessor, and Sadlitz was about a knot faster in turn than Moltke. Just as with the firepower, in all cases, a bit slower than the British designs. Or very much slower from Renown onward, but Renown onward are also wartime designs, so it balances out a bit. Otherwise, not so much to talk about with Sadlitz that wasn't already covered in her own video. She was very similar to Moltke, other than her armor, speed, and some very minor changes to her weapon layout. And honestly, I'll cover the pre-war ship service history, at least in broad terms, in the second video, just as with the British ones. To round off this fairly lengthy video, we'll just talk about the main difference between German and British battle cruisers one last time. That armor, which I keep pounding on because it is the main difference. As mentioned, the Germans intended their ships to be used with the battleships as a fast wing. There was little enough attention paid to using them as raiders or the like, and this is reflected in, among other things, having a sh relatively short range and cramped living conditions aboard. Why bother having fancy living conditions if the crew will spend most of their time ashore? They can deal with cramped bunks for a few days, it's, it'll, it'll be fine, who cares about the crew? I'm sure they weren't happy about that but who listens to the poor enlisted anyway? But the biggest thing that holds to this concept is in having relatively heavy armor. Increasing with each design until the wartime ones, this armor was far thicker than the British designs and had increased coverage in comparison as well. I don't call these ships proto-fast battleships for no reason, though I'm sure someone will disagree with me there. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing for me anyway, but since I already covered that, we'll do what this little bit is really about. How does this compare to the British? Well, Jutland is, as always, the big thing. As I said in the British video, the ships lost were lost for reasons having just about nothing to do with their armor or lack thereof, and everything to do with insane powder handling. Thinner armor or not, the ships will be far like less likely to have exploded like they did if they had been using their powder properly. Does this mean the Germans wasted their time armoring their ships like they did if the British ships weren't going to go all explodey because of their lack of armor? Hmm. Well, you can make that argument, and it is the kind of argument that raged over the Lexington design over in America. I will freely admit to being biased in favor of the German concept. I love the GKs, Sablitz, and Ersatz York especially. But I tend to feel that, considering their intended roles, the Germans were right to use armor like they did. As much as the British ships became a fast wing of the battle line, they were still intended to hunt cruisers and other battle cruisers down. For this, their lighter armor made perfect sense, as it was still plenty enough for any cruiser and even for the German battle cruisers. And the lighter armor allowed for higher speeds than the German GKs. On the other side of the coin, the German ships were much more intended to get stuck in against enemy capital ships. If they happened to have to fight British battle cruisers, well, that was as much because the British went after them as anything else. And that once the British started using their ships as a fast wing, the Germans had to counter. I admit to making a mistake in the British video in regards to the Germans there, my bad. Since the Germans were intending to use their ships as fast light battleships as much as anything else, they needed heavier armor, and that armor certainly more than pr proved itself at Jutland, though it must be noticed that the British had serious issues with their shells exploding properly, so it becomes a bit harder to judge how the armor would have held up had they exploded properly. Or should I say they had an issue exploding properly when they weren't inside their ships? Regardless, not a single one of the German GKs came out at Jutland without more closely resembling Swiss cheese than a proper warship. Yet they only lost Lutzow, and that might even have been avoided with some different choices. 
as I'll talk about in her own video later. Sadelitz barely lent home, but she still did. The armor of the ships almost certainly saved them here, as even if they weren't likely to explode like the British ones did, if they had less protection, they would have suffered a lot worse than the Death Ride, and they already suffered pretty badly. So, back to the original question. Was the armor worth it? Yes, in my opinion anyway, even though the British choice wasn't wrong in its own right. Right. With that, we'll end this longest video here. The next one will, as the British counterpart did, cover the wartime service and wartime design of German GKs. As for the conceptual designs, maybe. We'll see how long that video is. I am going to cover those ships, though, because I quite like them and find them interesting designs to look at. Now, I'll see you in the next video. Like and please subscribe if you like the content. See you next time.